Aldous Huxley, trying to uh, analyse the form, said that there were three poles or worlds in which the essay may exist. There was the personal and the autobiographical, which was one, the objective, factual, or, and the abstract, universal. Nevertheless, Huxley thought that the most richly satisfying essays are those which make the best not of one or two, but of all three of these worlds in which it's possible for the essay to exist. So, and he also called the essay a literary device for saying almost everything about almost anything. Clearly it's a hybrid form, or at least a dynamic one. It has no real limitations and imposes few obligations on the writer other than to be interesting. An essay is the right length to explore an idea, and the amorphousness that this, defini that this definition implies is also characteristic of the essay. The word essay itself derives from the French word essay, essay how, do, how do I pronounce that? That's essay, right. to try or to attempt. As such, it's a form that's comfortable with ambivalence and uncertainty, interruption and diversion, but also profundity as well as simple observation. As a form, it's more or less a perennial, though there have been moments in relatively recent times when it seemed under threat. The essay as a literary form, wrote Philip Larkin in 1984, is pretty well extinct. He was fearful of the oncoming rush of content, of TV, games, movies and daily newspaper trash. In fact, it's made a major comeback in recent times. Larkin was scared of the internet before the internet even existed. Ironically, the internet, if anything, breathed, breathed new life into the form. The past couple of decades have introduced us to the likes of David Foster Wallace, John Jeremiah Sullivan, David Sedaris, Rebecca Solnit, Ariel Levy, Sheila Hetty, Roxanne Gay, Lena Dunham, all in North America. Janet Malcolm, Joan Didion and Barbara Ehrenreich have continued their great writing in recent years and if anything their stature's risen in recent times. In the UK and Europe, Jeff Dyer, Zizek, the late Christopher Hitchens have all been celebrated in various parts and many, even most, of the finest Australian writers have in recent years written in the essay form. Simon Lays, Clive James, Helen Garner, Christos Cholkis, Richard Flanagan, Kate Jennings, Tim Winton, Noel Pearson, Jermaine Greer, Chloe Hooper, David Marr, Anna Crean, Robert Mann, Karen Hitchcock. <laughs> see, see what I did Just there? You're <laughs> all waiting on tenderhood. <laughs> so Anna Crean, sitting on my left, is the author of Night Games, Sex, Power and Sport, Into the Woods, The Battle for Tasmania's Forests, and quarterly essay 45, Us and Them, on the importance of animals. Anna's work's been published in The Monthly, The Age, The Big Issue, Best Australian Essays, Best Australian Stories, Frankie, and The Griffith Review. On the far end, Robert Mann was Professor Emeritus at La Trobe University. He's Professor Emeritus at La Trobe University. And A regular did. commentator with The Age, Sydney Morning Herald, The Monthly, ABC Radio and TV, and unquestionably one of Australia's leading public intellectuals. Recent books include Goodbye to All That on the Failure of Neoliberalism and the Urgency of Change, Left, Right, Left, Political Essays, WH, WEH Stanner, The Dreaming and Other Essays, and as an editor, and Making Trouble, Essays Against the New Australian Complacency. He also wrote the first quarterly essay, In Denial, about the stolen generations, and has written two since then. Karen Hitchcock, in the middle, is a doctor and writer. She is the author of the acclaimed quarterly essay, recent quarterly essay, Dear Life, and an award-winning collection of short stories, Little White Slips. She writes a regular and widely admired column for the monthly and has written several feature essays for the magazine, including the most read essay of all time in the magazine, Fat City, and the cover article of the most recent issue, Too Many Pills. So Black Ink uh, have recently released the Short Black series, which I think is at the back of the room and on sale tonight, which is a series of great Australian essays from the past decade or so, uh, modern Australian classics, uh, which include works written by each of tonight's guests. 
And tonight we're going to talk about the particulars of essay writing versus other forms. And then we'll talk about each of our guests' work and finally open up the discussion for, for questions from the floor. So Joan Didion, who was one of the great modern essayists, spoke about choosing a subject. She said, something about a situation will bother me, so I'll write a piece to find out what it is. And it struck me that uh, amongst our writers here tonight, they have really completely different approaches, at least it seems to me, from an outsider's perspective about how to, how to uh, choose a subject or how to approach it. I think I'd like first Anna and Rob, I think you, you almost sit at different ends of the, of, the, of the spectrum. I get the impression, Rob, that you very much, you write an essay when you know exactly what you want to say or in what direction you, know, you want to end up in. Maybe. I mean, it's more that certain things have always um, obsessed me, and they're usually a combination of political and moral, and um, I can't let them go. Yeah. And um, I suppose because I'm obsessed by them, I know what, you know, the emotion, the affect I have, or what my heart is telling me about something or other. It's usually connected to justice in mm. some way. Um, but. It takes me a while to work out what I think, and um, you know that's. But you often, you seem very clear, at least from on my end of the email exchange. It seems very clear by the time you agree to write something that you kind of know what what it is that you're going to write, what argument you you you. Am I well, I wish that were true. I mean, I, you, you haven't seen the restless nights I spent. <laughs> I, I mean, I suppose I know roughly what I want to say yeah. before I start writing. But for me, anyhow, it's and there's a lot of research always in the kinds of things I do. But it's it's when I get the structure right in my head, which doesn't come, you know, without mm. a lot of pain mm. or thought. Um, it's that. At that time, I think at least I'm on the way. It doesn't make, you know, I'm still anxious before I start yeah. writing. Yeah. Anna, what about you? The, the, uh, the, the process is, does that, does Joan's, Joan Didion's quote ring true for you about yeah. finding out what it is yeah, I definitely, that bothers you? Yeah, I definitely write in order to understand. Um, and I'm, my editor's just there, and I actually, I don't think I've ever pitched to him. I just say there's, a subject, and I don't really know what it is I'm talking about, but I want to go and get in there. Get in there, and I'm just lucky that people have trusted me to do it because I have no idea what it is that I want to say or what I want to reveal. And I actually am quite nervous about providing something quite concrete to an editor before I've done that research because the story changes mm -hmm. and it should be allowed to change, and I don't want to get stuck on a platform that I don't feel comfortable on. Um, and I, but I often sort of go to subjects that aren't, you know, that lots of voices have weighed in on. Um, so you would think that it would be quite easy to have a stance or a side, but usually I find that the more voices that are on a subject, the more confused I am. Um, uh, so that's often where I'll want to dive into those as well. Hmm. What about you, Karen? Do you, do you, do you choose subjects? Like, why do you choose a subject? Is it because you have a burning passion to, to say something about it, or is it that you you want to explore, explore that issue and and you know illuminate? Mm, I think it's different, for lots of different reasons. So either something will really annoy me, and I'll you know I'll know what I want to say, like the over prescription of antidepressants or something, or uh, I won't know what I think about it. So obesity for example, and uh, so writing the essay will give me a chance to think it through. Or um, or I think something's been presented too simplistically, like the bullying in medicine um, <coughs> issue that I wrote about. Hmm. The too many pills, uh, I just thought there were too many pills and I didn't really know <laughs> <laughs> what to say or how to think it through or to... Um, uh, I just wanted to try and think of some reason, like why, mm -hmm. why, why do we love pills? Why is it so great to write a script and give it to someone? So, mm. yeah. Um, <coughs> there's a, a recent the the 
for fear of talking about the monthly all the time, but it's something that I know about. Um, there's an essay by Will Self in the coming issue, and he says that a writer should be like an anthropologist from Mars, so interrogating the most commonplace as if it's truly bizarre. So the reference was specifically about novelists in that case, but it could just as easily apply to the essayist. The point he's making, of course, is about objectivity, about the, the relationship the writer has to the subject. Um, Anna, do you think much about your own perspective, your own biases when writing? Because you often write, you in insert liberal doses of the first person in there. Mm. Is it just something that's sort of come about or do you do, you do, it, do, you do that deliberately? Is it to, like, as in to foreground subjectivity? Uh, I, I, it's, it's hard to think outside of your process, but um, I, I suppose in a way I do put myself into the narrative because I don't believe in object, objectivity, mm. um, but I believe in fairness and I believe in uh, self-interrogation. And I don't think, I don't trust a writer that doesn't constantly question themselves. And I, and then I'm constantly questioning myself and I think that actually works quite well into the narrative. And into also, I think it also often might echo the reader's own questions. Well, it leads, it leads the, the, the reader with you along into, yeah. into a subject. I mean, absolutely. Yeah, and often I would like, I like to explore areas where people um, are scared to say what they think because they think they may look uh, politically incorrect or uh, stupid or arrogant. And so um, I kind of like to use myself as the fall guy and mm. say, well, if I can look politically incorrect, if I can ask these questions, then so can you. Rob, do you believe in objectivity? Yeah, yeah, essentially. I mean, I, I think it's very hard to achieve and it would be very hubristic to think, you know, you can do it yourself with any degree of confidence. But um, it's, it's not that f far from fairness in a way, but it's, mm. it's, it's the attempt at least to take everything into consideration and to form a, a judgment and a balance. And um, I actually interpret the will self a bit differently. It's mm. strange, I didn't know he said that, but I used to say to my students often when I was teaching, uh, let's think about how an intelligent English speaking Martian would think about this. And I, th I think it's the issue actually of um, seeing things without the taken for grantedness. Yeah. So that if you you know if you're discussing Australia, let's say you're discussing asylum seeker policy, the things we now, t now take for granted, anyone coming from the outside would find astonishing. It's taken us a long time to get to the position we're in. So, um, I, but I, I th but anyhow, on the question of objectivity, I think at least it's like truth. Um, you, you strive for it. You strive for it. And yeah. and you know you read things which you think are more or less objective or more or less objective mm. and um, which is a different mm. concept and mm. and I certainly <coughs> think that both the striving for objectivity and and the striving for truthfulness is at least in the F essayist I admire and the one that got me going really and made me want to be an essayist was George Orwell I think um, questions like fairness striving for truthfulness or objectivity, mm. seeing things as, as well as you can as they are, um, is, is, is a, a, yeah. an aim of, of mine anyhow. Karen, do you, do you no, think much about these things? I had a nervous breakdown when you when said the word objective. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you, you, you contained it very well. <laughs> my demeanour. Uh, I, yeah, I don't know. I've never even thought about objective. I don't even know if it exists subjective. I don't even know how to begin to think about if it... And then you start talking about truth and then I get even more nervous. And But uh, th but you did say something... Truthfulness, I said, which is different. The, the quest for truthfulness. Just, okay. just write a script. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you want a pill? <laughs> yeah, no, I... Mm. The anthropologist from Mars, I think that's from Oliver Sacks. Yeah, no, he right? borrowed. Did he actually he borrowed it from. Um, well, he, where he was it quoted Temple from? Grand Grandin. Is that how you say it? Oh yeah. Temple Grandin. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. yeah. Um, one thing I did think when all these big words that I didn't really know what they mean was that uh, um, when I'm in the hospital, I'm so fully present as a doctor and not think, you know, I'm right in there. And, you know, we all go into meetings and we'll leave grumbling, going, oh, that's just ridiculous. And then we'll just go off and do our ward rounds and be very, very busy. But then I sort of try and take those grumbles and then I get up very early in the morning and that's when I write. And in that little space in my study, I'm completely outside the hospital and I don't know if that is a way, but, you know, just to be an outsider or to be outside of the situation is what uh, enables me to write at all. So I'm just outside of it and then I can take the grumbles and turn them into a something. And so when you say it's something, do you, is it like an intuitive process? Do you sit down, do you have rules about when you start to write, how you, what are you going to write about that day? No, 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 no. I just have this overwhelming feeling of being pissed off about something or yeah. um, uh, confused about something or troubled and nagged about something and uh, challenged by something. The reason that I wrote Fat City was that as a junior doctor in the hospital, I just didn't know what to do because you're in this situation where you're either really moralistic or, you know, you were just ignoring the fact that this person's crumbling before you and I just didn't know how to think about it and so I wrote that essay... Um, uh, just to try and interrogate the confusion that I felt as a as a doctor and as a citizen of the world. Hmm. Have you, Anna and Rob? I'd be interested. Have, have, have you? Have, has your technique kind of changed, developed? Has it become something that you do steadily now? As in, it's you've both been writing for you know for a long time. What what how has it changed over those years? Do you think you've become more so it's been become more formalised in the way that you actually sit down and approach subjects? Uh, Anna, do you want to start? <laughs> um, I definitely think as a muscle, it's gotten definitely gotten better. I've gotten better at my craft, and I've you know gotten faster because I'm you know sort of. Going, I remember doing uh, Into the Woods and, you know, it was a bit like a dog's breakfast. And, mm. You know, um, it was all over the shop and I didn't know how to structure it. And then, you know, then I just felt like I was getting better at it when I did the quarterly essay and I had a shorter time frame, but I still managed to get quite a lot done and started to... I was able to structure it much better before I sent it to Chris, my editor. So, um, yeah, I was definitely getting better at it and now that I'm writing fiction um, I'm just very much very yearning to go back to non-fiction because I definitely I know that muscle was much fitter yeah yeah than my fiction is at the moment it, and that's the good thing about essay writing is that that you can incorporate fix, yeah. fiction tech fictional kind of techniques exactly. into non-fiction exactly. writing yeah yeah, yeah. Um, I, I mean I, I've been writing essays you know since I suppose the 70s um, and in a way, it's the most, for me the most natural form. I, I actually think I, I've always done it in much the same way, and it's roughly this: there's something that angers me, a bit, or some sense of injustice which obsesses me, or some sense of usually something terrible that I think is going to happen, which mm. worries me. Then the bit I, is really totally enjoyable is I read and read and read everything I can to try and understand as much as I can about the subject, and my room then fills with thousands of papers lying all over the place which I, where I know to get to them. Um, and then I have this anguish of finding in my mind the structure. Um, and when I get that, my wife, Anne, says I'm like a Prussian. I, I mean, I've, I'm just writing something at the moment and I've known every day which... I've known the structure and every day I write and you know, unless I get it absolutely right on that day, I have bad dreams about a comma being misplaced or whatever and at the end and I know how many days it will take me and and then it happens and you have the plan you have it planned out from the start the structure yeah I write it down yeah you know six six sections I know the sections mm. um, Chris knows I'm like this I go into a completely lockdown mode where I'm almost unapproachable um, and Mm. And then something comes out at the end. Sometimes then I, I like what I've done. Sometimes I think I haven't done what I should have. But, but it's, it's a 
It's a very structured process. And, you know, I'm, you know, the way Anna talks, my wife Anne writes, and she writes much more like Anna, you know. Mm. She drafts all over the place and bits and pieces and it comes together sort of gradually. It, it, mm. it forms itself probably more really artistically, whereas mine is more of, of a kind of a mm. humanistic scientist yeah, yeah. in some way. Do you have a word limit every day? No, but I usually write the same amount. How many? Um, <laughs> between 1,000 and 2,000. Oh, yeah. It's funny though, it doesn't matter how much you write um, or how much is published, the patheticness of your life doesn't seem to change. <laughs> <laughs> like, you still go through the same self-loathing, I am so stupid, what I'm am I doing, here again. My, life, my life is meaningless, I really should go be an aid worker. Anna, shall I cheer you up? It gets worse as you get it older. It gets worse, <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, I, I want to sort of pull back a little bit. Um, Rob, you wrote the first quarterly essay, as I mentioned before, and at the time, the, the, the long essay wasn't really a format that existed in Australia. Um, so, I mean, I, I want to talk about the sort of the recent history of essay yeah. writing in Australia, okay. but also, if you could take us back, what, what were your first thoughts when someone, when, when you heard about this idea of the quarterly essay, as in what, uh, about the viability of something, of a form like that in Australia? Well, I, I, I mean, I actually, no, I mean, this is, again, kind of indirectly self-serving. I think Maurice Schwartz, who's behind so many of these enterprises, is one of the great creative minds. So the entrepreneurs of ideas, and it came to him. Uh, and as soon as he told me about it, I thought, what a great idea. Hmm. Um, what, what really happened was that you I... Went, there were a lot of doubters. I mean, you, you would have been one of the unusual ones at the time. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I never think... I used to joke about Murray that he has some of the worst ideas in publishing and some of the best, and I wasn't sure whether it would sell, you know. But I don't think like that, but I thought as a, an enterprise it mm. was a great idea. Um, what, what got me going, actually, was that I had been, you know, for my sins, an editor of Quadrant for many years, and I was meant to be drawing it too much to the left, and it was taken over by the now-departed Paddy McGuinness, um, and he was running a campaign against the Stolen Generations idea. And then he published three long pieces from someone who'd been once on the left, Keith Winshuttle, now well known, which was really saying that it is a myth that uh, Aboriginal people were destroyed, you know, and killed in large numbers in the 19th century. I was so outraged, you know, your anger, at that this was happening, and particularly because it was a magazine that I was associated with in the past. Um, that you know, I, mm. I was just determined to write it, and you know, and uh, I never, for a moment, thought it was, was not a good idea to try to yeah. to, to get that objective, mm. to get an objective account of what had happened to the Aboriginal children mm. um, in that in the, between 1910 and 1970. And what was the? I mean, it feels to me that the landscapes changed significantly in in the past sort of what. 15 years, like I think uh, there's a lot more essay writing going on now um, than there was then, but is that, um, is that just me? No, I think, I think it's true. I, I mean, the one thing that really has changed, I think, I was thinking about this, you know, when I knew I was coming here, that there used to be really um, fierce debates about things. I think the two last debates in the sort of literary cultural area were, were the two Helens, Helen Demodenko and Helen Garner, mm. uh, the first stone and um, uh, what was it called? Uh, the Hand That Signed the Paper. I wrote a book about it and I've forgotten the title. Um, uh, but I don't think that happens much anymore. I think there's been a proliferation of essays. I mean, there's, I wanted to say this, there's an astonishing person called Guy Rundle who produces a kind of essay every day. I, I don't know how he does it, but it's very loose mm. and it's often full of, you know, factual <laughs> half <laughs> errors half and truths. Yeah. Um, but but there's a loop, been a loosening up, and I think there's been a real kind of splitting up of the public square, mm. so that all sorts of things. And there's much more sort of um, outrage all the time that someone says, you know, Mark Latham says something, and everyone is outraged at it. And uh, but I don't, what I what I miss a little bit. There's ma so there's much more non-fiction writing and mm. blogging and all the rest of it. What I miss a bit is the serious argument. I used to take for granted 
that if you made a case, a serious case, either people accepted it or they had to argue against it. But now things just pass without sort of comment, even very serious pieces. So I th I'm a bit disappointed with the, the lack of toing and froing, mm. arguing, and the sense that we can get towards truthfulness mm. um, by, by the, the process of argument. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, there's the, the, the internet has given rise to this kind of phenomenon of, uh, of sharing, right? And there's a graph um, that someone made up which is about uh, what sort of content that people share online, socially. And if you think about the, the graph being uh, time, length of time it takes to consume this, the, the product, whether it be like a, an article or a video, and the amount that it's shared, very short, like for want of a better word, cat videos and sort of jokes get shared a lot. Things that are medium length, don't really get shared that much at all. And then at the other end, it loops straight back up again. So long, long essays are the things that are most shared, besides cat videos. Um, so, you know, the, this, the phenomenon of, as we call it, the phenomenon of Fat City, um, it had three quarters of a million readers over a month or two, like, when was it? Uh, it, it sort of had two two sort of rounds of the social media uh, world, and it was all through Facebook. It was people in the states and through through Australia just sharing, sharing, sharing. But the the interesting thing is was to me that every that we talk about uh, the internet as being you know ephemera, and you're right that there's this kind of sense of ongoing scandal and skirmish. But on the other hand, it's sort of given rise to, it's, it's you know, the, the essay has been reborn. So the New Yorker and the Atlantic, they thrive and it's on the back of their very, very long, very serious kind of essay. So there's, that's kind of a counterbalance. Um, I don't have a question for you. That's just a, an observation. <laughs> no, but I, I wanted to ask if you actually thought about um, the audience that you were writing for when you were writing something. Like, did, did Karen, I mean, that's your piece. Would mm. you ever have had in mind the fact that, you know, hundreds of thousands of people would read it, get angry or, or applaud it? No, not at all. I know I always write them pretending no one's going to read them with the caveat that I do ask uh, if something's particularly controversial, I ask a, a few doctor colleagues to read... You know, so when I wrote about antidepressants, I asked a few psychiatrists at the hospital to read it just to make sure I wasn't going to make people kill themselves or something. Mm. But apart from that, uh, I pretend no one's going to read it. And no, I had no idea. That was just my second essay I'd ever written, really. Mm. Your second essay you'd ever written, really. So ha tell me, how did you become a writer as well as a doctor? Well, I wrote fiction. So yeah. I studied English and then I became a doctor to be a psychoanalyst, which I didn't do. But then I ha always thought of myself as a fiction writer. And then I, I believe what happened is Helen Garner asked John Van Tegelen, who was the um, editor of The Monthly in 2012, said you should get her, to, should get me to write some... Mm. Uh, essays about medicine because we, we correspond by email and I tell her all the horrific stories and everything. <coughs> this would be great in an essay. And so he asked me um, on numerous occasions, I kept saying, No, I don't want to, what do I have to, I don't have anything to say. And then um, in 2012, I, I said, Okay, fine, I'm really pissed off about the fact that um, acute and general medicine is so underfunded in Australia and we really need these kind of specialists to look after the uh, patients with lots of organ dysfunction and it's terrible. And so I wrote an essay, that was my first essay. Hmm. And how did you find that process as being your first essay? Uh, I think it was fine. The thing that I tend to do is write too much and then just go here. <laughs> and then <laughs> the poor editors have to carve away a lot. So Fat City, I think, is five and a half thousand words or something, and the first draft was 12,000 words. <laughs> but I don't really do that things that long anymore. But although the quarterly essay, I'm looking at Chris in the front row, <laughs> once I think I gave him 40,000 and it ended up being <laughs> 20. <laughs> yeah. Rob, do you do the same? I mean... You, you you write with a very often with a quite specific kind of purpose, like a you know a political purpose. Mm. So, 
inherent in that is the understanding that it's for for a particular audience. How specifically do you think about the well, audience? As in, are you writing for a you know centrist, centre left audience, or do, do you think of things in that way? No, I mean, I, with, I, there are about three people that, whose reading of it I care about. A couple are in the room. Um, I, t I actually tend to mainly th think of who will be ma really pissed off by this. Um, I'm usually contending. I'm usually trying to, I mean, this is a hopeless task, but to change things, to make people rethink things and to take on powerful people um, or powerful opinions that seem to me to be wrong or doing harm or whatever. So I think, I think politically, in a way, about what I'm doing. Um, and it's not, it really is not so much who will like this, apart from the three or four people, but who will find this annoying enough to feel challenged by it. Mm. What about you, Anna? Oh, I was hoping you'd skip me. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, no, it's, such a, uh, it's such a funny question, like, do you imagine your audience? Like, I can you sit down and you imagine. I, I, don't, I don't think so. I don't think... I think about my audience, um, but I definitely am. A, I definitely find myself having to sort of be brave and go. Well, this is not going to make me friends, or this might lose friends, or this um, I'm going to have to say this, and uh, you know. I, I could I could probably not I could probably get away of not saying this, but this needs to be said. Mm. Um, and often I find that my most fiercest my fiercest uh, critics are people who I would probably um, get on quite really well with. Um, so you know my fiercest critics have often been vegans and vegetarians or um, forest activists and mm. all those kind of people. So they're usually the ones that. Um, end up not liking me. So, <laughs> um, which I think is really a bit unfair. But, uh, and I just, yeah, I guess I think in a sense that I'm not, I, I, I know that my audience can't be my friends. Yeah. You know, I'm not writing for friendship. Yeah, yeah. So. Karen, I, I often wonder about with your writing. You know, as a, you have a, you're a doctor, and you work in the hospital. You know, every day. Do you? Can a doctor can a doctor first of all kind of afford to question received notions in a way that a writer can? And you know, a, a, I guess the linked question is: uh, Are you ever worried that your writing will affect? your reputation as a doctor or your professional place? Mm -mm. I have very rarely been accused of being a doctor basher because it's so easy to bash doctors because we're so imperfect. Um, uh, I always feel that I'm trying to defend medicine. I love medicine so much and uh, um, I uh, do... Uh, I feel very loyal towards my colleagues and towards medicine and uh, um, and I've only ever had support from them actually. I do feel a lot of anxiety sometimes before something's published and I worry, in too many pills, I worried that I'd been uh, too negative about um, doctors and medicine but um, uh, I, my, my colleagues, I work in a public hospital, you know, we're a bunch of Bolsheviks, they tend to agree with me, mm. so um, <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> I don't work in a private hospital, I don't know what they think. I don't care. Mm. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Um, I do worry about it, but, um, but I've never been in trouble, and I think I'm careful, and I think I'm fair. Yeah. And I think everyone, I think it's evident that I'm trying to defend medicine, not, I'm not trying to attack it. Yeah. I'm trying to protect it from evil forces of big pharma and industry. And yeah, and, and, and you know, it's a gift to us as readers that you're able to put medicine in a social context and, and talk about, uh, you know, about how medicine and society, you know, how 
medicine's part of society, public health is part of society. I sort of wanted to move on uh, just in the sort of 10 minutes that we've got before we open it up to talk about this idea of um, social change and the change that's possible, whether a piece of writing can actually affect social change. So there's a theme that runs through the essays. Well, it's not a th theme that runs through all of the essays, but many of the best, the strongest uh, essays that have been published in Australia uh, over the past decade or so have been about Indigenous issues, about Indigenous dispossession, uh, Boo's Territory, which is Anna Crean's essay in this new short black series, is about uh, the problems of alcoholism in remote communities. Uh, Rob, your essay uh, in denial was obviously uh, a, a sort of landmark essay. Uh, well, first, I, I mean, I wanted to ask each of you, firstly, I'm oh, sorry, the other, the other really notable essay in this series is Galloway Unipingu's essay, which I, I believe was one of the reasons that the whole uh, venture was kind of started to republish these essays. It was called Tradition, Truth and Tomorrow, and it's really haunting reading. Uh, when we had a recent change of leadership, I thought about this essay again, and I think a lot of people did. It's, it's Yuna Pingu, who's uh, an ind Indigenous leader from Arnhem Land, looking back through the years of Indigenous politics in Australia that he's been part of. And he's talking about all of the Prime Ministers that he's met, and he, he says, I've, you know, he basically says, I've seen them come and go, and they've come up and visited him, and then they go away again, and then he has another one. And then, you know, in Abbott, all these hopes invested by the Indigenous community in Tony Abbott, he came, he came up and he spent a week up there and now he's gone again. And Noel Pearson, who's written this other essay recently, um, I've forgotten the title of it, but it's, it's also in this collection. It was uh, a section of his quarterly essay. Uh, he, you know, he spent a lot of time talking to Tony Abbott and he spent a lot of time talking to several Australian Prime Ministers and they come and they go. And, and so little has changed that I, I sort of wanted to ask you, Rob, do you think uh, something like In Denial, uh, how, how has how's the situation changed? Do you think this, uh, do you think essays can have social and political effects? Uh, yeah, I'm sure they can. I, I, um, I'm, they can have good and bad effects. I actually think, through his essays, um, Noel Pearson did something very important, which was to break a kind of taboo on speaking about the problems of Aboriginal communities, a particular taboo on the left or amongst, as Americans would call them, liberal-minded people. Um, and I, I'm sure that changed, changed things, uh, you know, this sort of ambivalently in a way, because it also gave license to a certain kind of old-fashioned racism which is very strong in Australia. But, so that to me is a case of an essay which changed, it. and they can change things for the worse. I think the three essays that Keith Winshottle published in Quadrant, followed by his books, uh, gave license to a, an absurd view that, that uh, we were falsely feeling shame at the treatment of Aboriginal people in this country and that called up it, it, legitimated mm. those things. So I'm certain that essays can change things, um, but that may not be always yeah. for the good. Yeah, um, yeah. But I, I do think, you know, arguments that hit the spot with public matter a lot. Can you think of essays, this for all three of you, that have changed your mind? I can think of one. Uh, uh, Dear Life, uh, the, the recent quarterly essay that Karen wrote changed my mind. It substantially changed my mindset about how uh, society sort of views uh, caring for the elderly, which is a subject that I you know, never thought I'd be particularly excited by. Um, Even though you're going to be old. Even though, yeah, but you know, that's even though you're that's denying it, it's never, never, ever. Ever. It's never <laughs> not going to happen to me. <laughs> um, no, but but it really, you know, it's something that I hadn't thought about and uh, much about, and it it really had a sort of it, it profoundly changed things for me. Um, I yeah, I don't know, Anna, do you um, 
Can you think of things that have had a major impact or writers? Uh, I just, um, in, I think, just harking back to something you said before about the politicians, the prime ministers coming and going, I just had one thought, which is a bit depressing really, but um, Yami Lester, uh, an indigenous elder out um, in, near uh, Maralinga in South Australia said to me once, you journalists, you come and go. And I kind of think that we come and go as well. So mm. um, I'm not entirely sure. Mm. Um, um, I mean, lots of things. I mean, I, uh, for example, I'm now obsessed by climate change. Um, I, I know the day in which I suddenly thought about it. I'd never really thought about it. It was a very hot day. And, um, and I read The Weathermakers, Tim Flannery, um, in, in, up in Cottles Bridge. You know, and I, I thought something I hadn't thought about. I thought it was just another environmental problem and one day I'd get round to it. Um, hmm. And my eyes suddenly opened. I, you know, I thought hmm. it was like an epiphany. If this is all true, what, are we, what in the hell are we doing? Another one, um, uh, oh well, yeah, uh, I, this was not an essay, it was a line. I was wa walking across my, in front of the television and it was a documentary on Aboriginal history and they read a thing from a conference in 1937 uh, where someone was saying um, do, uh, something like, we must look forward to the day when there are no Aboriginal people in this country. And that's, it, it had a particular effect on me because that was for me the inner sense of what a genocide meant and the mm. destruction of the Jews was the centre of my political identity. And I suddenly, I, I rushed to the library to see whether it had been a misquote from this conference and completely changed, it, that's why I got interested really in the stolen generations. So lots of things mm. have had, a, you know, even small things have had a profound effect in changing me or opening my eyes or whatever. Mm. I think, yeah, I mean, I'd Sorry, think largely just, most writing. If you could prepare some questions. Most good essays would change you as well. I mean, that's the whole point of a good essay is to get beyond the slogans. Like, yeah. I mean, David Kilcullen's recent uh, quarterly essay, Blood Year, was amazing in the sense that you realise how stupid you were in, you know, sort of saying things offhand like, you know, Bush bad, Obama good, when, you know, it turned out that there was a lot more complex situation and Bush ended up being quite a good leader, but it was too late. And, you know, all these, mm, these kind mm. of situations that all, I think all good essays um, change you in revealing complexity and mm. yes. yeah. right. Richard Dennis, his yeah. recent essays in the monthly have. Uh, I wouldn't. This is such a black ink yeah. fest. It's kind of gross. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> what did you say? It's such a black ink fest. We need. We need to. We need to um, <laughs> stop self promoting here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's changed me. Uh, the essay that he wrote on economic modelling, and it didn't really change what I thought, but it was. It was such a yes. I knew they were bullshitting me. You know, I mm. thought it was such a terrific essay, and uh, but, but I'm trying to think what's changed. I'm, all the great essays, I'm thinking they just reinforced what I already thought. But but when I was 11, I did write a, read a graphic novel called When the Wind Blows about oh, a I nuclear the, winter. Yes, yeah. And that, that did change my life, actually. Mm, yeah. That was when I became an activist at the age of 11 because yeah. it was just the most terrifying thing. It's about this elderly couple in a bomb shelter who don't understand about radiation sickness and they go out for baked beans and they gradually die and their teeth fall out and everything and it was really horrific so it wasn't an essay and it was mostly so pictures. So did you understand it, it had a when you read it? Because I, I had no idea what was I, going on. I understood, on. yeah. yeah okay. It was horrific, horrific. It haunted me but I really yeah. had no idea. They were dying. Yeah. That's yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because of a bomb. Yeah. Any, any questions? The back there. Um, thanks so much for your talk. Uh, the American website Slate published a piece quite recently about the boom in first-person essays online mm. and made the point that they're becoming more and more harrowing as people need more and more to shock them. Do you think when you're writing from a personal perspective that there should be limits about what's being shared or, or do you have any thoughts about whether the harrowing essay is, um, is a, a good thing in the history of essays? It has to be relevant. You have to be, if you're going to be in the essay, then you have to. Be, it has to be a relevant inclusion. That's. What's the point of the? What? What? I mean, the question is, 
why are they writing about something harrowing? Is it just for titillation? Or no, is no, it it's to people make writing, them? people oh. sort of writing confessionals and they're, they're mm. increasingly kind of explicit confessionals that people yeah, yeah, are writing. But, so, but what's mm. it just to confess? Is that or to make a point? Oh, That's no, to sort of to, to, to explain, like, you know, like to talk about the sexual abuse that they suffered as a child mm. or to, you know, that they're, they're sort of. Um, psychological problems, or I mean, it, it's, no, I, I it's a good point because there are there, it, there is a rise in these kind of things. Um, eventually, it, I, for me, it, I find it has a kind of strangely dulling effect. Mm. Because yeah, that was that, that was. I, I mean, I, I haven't read that many of that sort of essay, but I would have thought if there are too many. I mean, I, I, I heard someone say recently, a publisher, I think, that they're very hard to sell. That people absolutely take yeah. you know put their experiences, which are have shaped their lives into a book and then no one wants to read it or publish it. Um, so that, that uh, it's a terrible thing, that yeah. the discrepancy between the intensity of the affect in the author and the indifference of the general readership. Yeah. But I, I must it's say like I think... diminishing returns, if, yeah. If people say truthfully about what has happened to them without, you know, without fear and so on, it's, it seems to me a good thing. Um, mm. It depends what they do with it. That not mm. that the question? Yeah. Because, I mean, if, if there's some sense of trying to make meaning from it or mm. understand it or something, then that has value for people. Mm. But otherwise it belongs in a therapist office, doesn't yeah. it? I mean, what, what's... Just, if it's illuminating. Just the confess yeah. confessional is mm. not something that I would it'd read. It normally would be trying to make meaning, I think, or, you know, to, to overcome something that has shaped a life and to think that if you can put it down... Uh, as accurately as you can, that some meaning will then for you and for others. Well, that's not emerge. enough for a reader. No, I mean, that's that's, a, that's, a what, that's exactly thing, it. it so. That, so, and other people aren't that interested. It turns yeah. out, and often these books, no one else wants to read them. But I'm sure they are written by people who want to, as it were, salvage their lives and to find meaning. I know enough about one or two cases like that to know that that was the reason for doing it. it must be incredibly sad for these people to suddenly realise that. No one is all that concerned with them. I think when a good writer does it, mm. um, but they don't do it too often, and only when it really calls for it. Like Ariel Levi wrote that incredible piece mm. in the New Yorker um, about um, Miss having a, a stillborn um, whilst trying to do a story in Mongolia, and it was this incredible, um, bizarre weaving of a journalistic endeavour to cover. Mongolia whilst having a slow death inside her. Uh, this, this is things that should never have happened and, and you would never think this, is not, this was not her assignment. And then it was just the most incredible piece mm. and so revealing and so illuminating and harrowing. Uh, but it worked and, it's, and it, I guess it also worked because she doesn't always have st um, stillbirths in every essay. <laughs> you know, oh, I mean, but the yeah. reason that that, for me, the reason that essay was so powerful was because she was so brutally honest about mm. her self-destructiveness exactly. and that she yeah. had made these just choices that, w yeah. you know, had resulted in this. And yeah. so it was, it, it actually was, it wasn't just I've had a miscarriage, it's really sad. It was, you know, I did these look up, look up. crazy things yeah. and mm. this is what happened and this is the, it was, it was so brutally honest and I thought that was what was really Yeah, it was a real critique it. of her humanity. Yeah. 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 And I think in that sense, um, that can work. But also that, that was a writer obviously needs to write. Yeah. Mm. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I'd like to ask all three um, panellists to comment on a matter which was touched on earlier, which is the apparent absence of review writing in the non-fiction segment of the market. Do you concur that review writing is minuscule and that that's regrettable? If so, do you have any suggestions for how it can be enlivened? You mean book reviews? Is that what you're talking? Is that what you're cultural talking? Cultural well, reviews. Pati cultural reviews yeah. generally, but book reviews particularly. I'm thinking of the comparison between the ABR 
and the New York Review of Books and the London Review of Books and the Times Literary Supplement, so in, which are in, very different in their structure. So in Australia in particular, you're, you're mm. commenting about... In yeah. Australia, yeah, we're, we're conditioned to a one-page review yeah. Yeah. Of, yeah. of fiction writing or non-fiction writing. It doesn't really matter. It still only gets a one-page review. Uh, I, mean, I, mm. I, I completely agree with yeah. that. Um, there is quite a good thing now called the Sydney Review of Books, which is online and which does have longer reviews. Um, and I once actually thought and even suggested for a moment that I might try and edit uh, something like that. Because I, don't, I actually don't think that uh, 700 words or 1,000 words or even 1,500 words is enough for an important book. Mm. And I, I actually think reviewing is completely, book reviewing is completely fundamental to a culture of books. That I, I feel if, if a thing hasn't been properly reviewed of mine or of people I know, then it hasn't been, in a way, has finally the published. Culture, yeah. it, the whole process hasn't happened. So I completely concur with that. Although I do think um, Sydney Review of Books is good when I look at it occasionally. But I, think, I do think there is, and I think the, uh, the Australian's Review of Books was quite good. For when it lasted for a while, I think the, the monthly has good reviews, but not enough. And no, not long no. Enough, I, I look, think. I think. I mean, I think film and theatre and music. There's there are so few outlets for long form uh, cultural criticism yeah. in Australia at the moment. You know, there's only there's only so much that you know one a magazine like like we can do with 11 issues a year and a yeah. small section up the back. It, this is a, a very broad kind we of problem. We need something like New York Review of Books yeah. or London Review of Books, and we've sort of got it a bit with the Sydney one, but it's not well enough known. Yeah, no, I agree. I don't know why, really. Thank you. Um, I'm actually an ex-student of Roberts, and I remember you talking about English-speaking Martians. Um, <laughs> but my question's for Anna. Um, you mentioned that you don't think of your who your intended audience is while you're writing. Um, but I was just wondering, with Night, game, night Games, were you not th hoping that there would be an intended audience or were you just hoping to facilitate a conversation that wasn't really taking place? Or what, what was happening for you while you were writing that? Yeah, I guess, yeah. I mean, to not have an audience in mind doesn't, doesn't say that I'm not hoping it will be read. Um, but... Uh, yeah, I guess, I mean, I guess what you hope f f um, to happen when a book or a piece of writing comes out is that the people, the right people read it or the people who need to read it, read it. Um, and then that's, in the game, and the idea of night games is that you hope uh, the football community will read it and you hope that um, young, young boys will read it, t young teenagers and, um, you know, community football coaches. That's, that was really my main... I mean that would that was they would be my priority audience, um, but that doesn't. But I I don't think I, I never really would alter my style accordingly, but that would really be who I would hope to read it because that is where the change could take place. Does that help at all? Mm. <laughs> I think there was a question up the front here. Uh, we heard uh, you spoke about writing process earlier, and Robert, you spoke to you said that you get through a thousand to two thousand words in a day, um, most commonly. Uh, so this was writing. We didn't hear any mention of rewriting. Uh, <laughs> what's your focus on rewriting? Mine. Um, I don't rewrite at all. I I struggle. My first draft is usually my last draft. I mean, if it's gone really badly, I have to rewrite. But most of that really hard work happens before I start. And it's almost in my head when I, when I start. So I don't, I don't do much rewriting uh, unless things have gone badly. Anna? Uh, um, I definitely rewrite, but I don't really know when it officially starts. I guess I'm always going forwards and then backwards and then forwards and backwards through a draft, so something, a section may get redone over and over, but it hasn't, it's hard to know. It's hard to really have a, an official uh, version of what you do. Um, but there's definitely a lot of rewriting. Um, there's a lot of tinkering. 
Um, and there's a couple moments when the, you know, something is perfectly polished. Usually that moment is the thing I think is got never going to make it into print and that's the bit that gets in without any red pen. So it's usually my freest moment and I just think, oh, I'm just going to let it all go here and I know that my editor will just get rid of it and usually that's the bit that goes in. So, um, yeah, but there's a lot of rewriting. Yeah, I do lots of drafts particularly the column, because there's only 1,000 words and I'm always over. And so you always have to cut precious mm. sentences. Yeah. <laughs> I think we've got time for one more. Do we have one more question? Up the front here. Um, thanks. This is a question in two parts. Um, the first is, as an editor and as readers, um, what about the form of an essay has excited you recently. And the second part for the writers, how do you hone or refine your inner BS detector? Thanks. So the first question was, which, what, what about the form yeah. of the essay? Yeah, that's kind of perked your interest. Gosh, I don't know. Um, I, you know, the more, I, it's just such a sort of flexible form. The more I read, uh, I think the more I come down to um, this idea that there are only two forms of writing. There's good writing and bad writing. I, I don't, I kind of don't, there's everything, there are very few formal inventions, you know, that have appeared in the past, uh, you know, decade or two that are new. Uh, at least in, in, in my sort of knowledge. So, look, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm excited by the fact that, as I said before, that, that people are sharing long-form journalism now. I think that's the, the, the most interesting development of, of recent years. Uh, the inner bullshit detector. Um, yeah. I have one. It's this really, this feeling of nausea. I just go, yeah. I'm like, oh no, stop whatever I'm writing. <laughs> Usually in response to sentimentality or I don't know, something. But it is a physical feeling of being sick. <laughs> I have um, ones in this room and ones at home. <laughs> uh, yeah, one is my wife. Uh, yeah. I, 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 everything that I, before I submit to a publisher, everything I write, I send to. Chris Fike, who's in the room, and I um, let my wife read. And um, I've tried to get rid of bullshit before, but they will pick it up. <laughs> I hope. If not, you know, I'll be punished. Can I? Yeah. Well, I, I kind of agree with Robert. I think the process is not a, it's not a solitary process. It's a relief once you get the draft off to your editor because they're the ones. So now it's officially teamwork and. Uh, they're the ones who are going to tell you, <laughs> and they better tell you when you are um, just making yourself sound much more smart than you are. Yeah, or else mm. we'll all be in trouble. Yeah, that's, right. um, that's all. Unfortunately, we have time for. Uh, there are copies of their essays in the at the back of the room. I'm sure they'll be available to sign them. Um, please thank Robert Mann, Karen Hitchcock, and Anna Crean. Thanks for coming. Please.